here today, and I appreciate Father Waltz inviting me. Um, as you mentioned, I've, Patty and I first uh, met John Jackson in 1981. Uh, he's part of the Shroud uh, Research Project of 1978, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And uh, if you go to shroud.com or shroud.org, both of them will point you to the same website. A lot of information there about the Shroud of Turin. You can, you can dive in pretty deep into that pool and uh, really never uncover everything that uh, we'll be just briefly talking about here today. But you're gonna have an opportunity to, to stand in a line like that uh, for, as Father, uh, Father Walt said, to spend about three minutes in front of the Shroud of Turin. This is right after Mass uh, a month ago, uh, yesterday. <coughs> I had the privilege of being there with my uh, my wife over here, who's uh, got a camera up, apparently, and uh, <laughs> and uh, six of our children. We have ten children. I was there for the feast of that about, on my birthday with my son's twenty fifth birthday. We were born the same day, so and a month and a half, two months before, we were even thinking of going there. So it all kind of worked out. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. Sometimes work out that way. And then uh, I do have some pictures from my experience because I don't know how many here speak Italian. Yeah, I didn't speak Italian either, so I didn't know what this meant when it said no photograph, no yeah, flash, no uh -oh. cellular. So you know, I was snapping away. Uh, that's actually from the first time we were at the Shroud for Mass in 2010 with my daughter Teresa, who's a student here at the University of Mary. And this was the Eucharistic procession after the Mass. Um, that picture there is kind of interesting because the next day Patty and I went to Mass one more time before we left Turin in the morning. and. Uh, I was determined, I've been in front of the Shroud probably three or four hours, several masses over those two visits, and I was going to bring a camera this time. I was just going to go in and, and enjoy the whole experience and not have anything electronic, any kind of other distraction. And as we, we walked up to see the Shroud at the end of Mass, because at the end of Mass they take you up in front of the Shroud, so you, you, you don't have to stand in line, you just go right up to see the Shroud. Uh, the cardinal that did the Mass was standing right in front of me. He pulls out his camera and starts snapping <laughs> pictures of the Shroud of Turin. Patty comes to me and says, Get your camera, take a picture of the camera, take the picture of it. No, I'm not doing it. So, uh, but you can't resist. And they'll tell you not to take pictures, not to bring your cameras out. Everybody does. So, uh, the only place where they seem to enforce that is the Sistine Chapel. Uh, other than that, I, my experience is they don't really care. So, you stand in a long line, you walk by um, these guys dressed up, you'll stand in some long tents. Uh, depending what time your viewing time is, uh, you know, you can stand in line for two or three hours. You'll be among the 20,000 people a day who see the shroud. They take you into a small room uh, before you go in, the group you'll be with, and you have a chance to learn a little bit about the history. They do a very nice job in the four or five minutes they show you the presentation. And then you'll be uh, standing in front of the Shroud of Turin, as these people were, in front of, inside this church, St. John the Baptist. It's been there since the 16th century. And then uh, this is what it kind of looks like from the pews when you're uh, at Mass inside. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the Shroud of Turin. Before I start my talk, I want to tell you that everything I say here today, um, you can be a good Catholic and not believe a word I say. The belief in the Shroud of Turin is not a doctrine of our faith or any relic or anything like that. You know, we have to believe that the body and blood is transformed into the blood of Christ and the body of Christ when we receive the Eucharist. Uh, but you don't have to believe the Shroud of Turin is actually the burial cloth of Christ. Now, it's either the burial cloth of Christ, in my opinion, or it's the greatest forgery of all time. It's one or the other. There really is no in-between for the Shroud of Turin. And the other thing I would say is popes tend to stay away from areas of controversy. And uh, since Pope John Paul II, every pope, uh, and Pope Francis next week, will be uh, attending Mass in front of the Shroud of Turin. They've all written about them. And also Pope Paul, who was the Archbishop of Milan, also had a lot of time in front of the Shroud of Turin as well when he would be over that. So let's talk a little bit about what happened to Jesus when he was crucified. Um, he was taken down from the tomb, uh, from the cross, and then he was uh, carried to a tomb in, uh, nearby. And the tomb would have looked something like this. This isn't the, the tomb of Jesus, but this is a typical tomb from the first century that they ex excavated. You can see the round stone that would have been rolled in front. Jesus would have been taken from the cross to the tomb, and then the shroud, that shroud would have been removed, and a fresh linen cloth would have been put on him in this manner here. So you can see how the cloth would have been one piece of cloth. It's about 14 feet long, and it's covered over him like this. And then afterwards they would have put a face cloth on him and then it would have looked, he would have looked something like this inside the tomb with the, the shroud over him. His hands and legs and 
Arms may have been bound, we don't know that for sure. Um, and that's kind of what it would look like. Here's another viewpoint, if you were looking towards his head, there was sand. Um, that was the first tomb of a wealthy Jew. So what happens after that? Easter, obviously. And we read in John chapter 20, Then Simon Peter went into the tomb, he saw the linen cloths lying, and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. The other disciple, John, it is presumed, went in, and he saw, and he believed. Well, he's looking at an empty tomb. <coughs> what did he believe? That Jesus was missing? That's not what they thought. They saw the linen cloths and believed. Luke chapter 23 and 24. After they'd taken the body down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth. 24, 13, 14. Peter got up, ran to the tomb, stooping and looking. He saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Again, no body, linen cloths. And they believed. John 20 again, the other disciple ran faster than Peter, arrived at the tomb first. He bent down, saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter, Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb. He saw the burial cloths there and the cloth 